Well, thank you all very much. Thank you to TOPS for that wonderful award. I'm really honored to be the first recipient. Over the course of the next 25 minutes, I'm going to update people on what's well, a new area of sort of research for me. And I want to, I think it highlights how the field of obesity has really brought together lots of different health disciplines and how work in this area is really making strong impacts across a lot of different spheres. So just in terms of disclosures, these are the companies that I've worked for. And as many of you have heard me talk know, I also like to disclose that because we're talking about obesity, I've worked for KFC in the past and I've worked for Tim Hortons. So I'm just, I was an undergrad before I knew better, but now we're fully disclosed. So just in terms of the complications of obesity. So we all know there's a myriad of medical complications, medical comorbidities, secondary to obesity. Same goes for mental illness. And I think now it's not news to anyone, or I hope it's not news to anyone, that there's some strong links between obesity and mental illness. We don't exactly understand why some of these associations exist, but we do know that they're there. And part of what I've been trying to do is to understand some other ways in which these areas overlap. So one of the areas that I think is particularly interesting is the concept of links between obesity and cognition. This is really relevant simply because cognitive problems and then issues like dementia are becoming really, really important as our population ages. There's also significant issues with cognitive problems in individuals who have mental illness. Oftentimes, we can get symptoms stabilized for people who have depression or bipolar disorder, but there's a cognitive impairment that, unfortunately, we can't seem to address. And oftentimes, that's a reason people are unable to return to work. It's not because they're symptomatic, but because there's lingering cognitive changes. And so I've been really interested in trying to understand what these cognitive changes and how they're associated with obesity. So as these two slides illustrate, just some work associating, looking at the associations between cognition and obesity later in life. And so this first slide was a large study that just looked at people over 36 years, and basically they were able to find that midlife obesity was a fairly significant risk factor for the development of not just vascular dementia, which is associated with problems with hypertension, but actually Alzheimer's dementia as well. Same thing for the second study, looked again at associations between specific patterns of obesity distribution, waist to hip ratio, and again found a small but significant association with where we put weight on early in life and then the development of dementia later. And these findings hold true even if you control for things like diabetes, cholesterol, all of these other risk factors. So those things play a role in and of themselves, but there's something specific just about weight change that also seems to be a risk factor. Same thing with cognitive decline and metabolic syndrome. We know that if you have obesity and you have metabolic syndrome, your risk of having later life dementia significantly increases. And this is increased even further if we're able to find inflammatory changes. And so if there's inflammation associated with the metabolic syndrome, risks of later life cognitive problems increase significantly. So what do we do with this information? We thought about this for a while. We were really interested. But one of the challenges in doing research around obesity and trying to understand causative mechanisms is that it's difficult to do the reverse. It's very difficult to find a population that has significant weight problems make them lose weight and then see what happens in the reverse direction. Of course, fortunately, in the last few years, we've had available to us a tool that we know is going to guarantee significant weight change in a large portion of the population, and that's bariatric surgery. So what we did was we put together a really complicated study design in which we looked at individuals who were going for bariatric surgery. We divided them up into three groups, those with depression, those with bipolar disorder, and those who simply had weight problems but didn't have mental illness. And then we compared that to a control population that didn't have weight issues. And we looked at changes over time. So before a person had surgery, they had 
a variety of cognitive tests. We put them in a scanner and we did a variety of MRI scans and then we looked at them after they lost the weight. So we wanted to see what they looked like before weight loss and then after weight loss. And I can tell you there were some challenges in doing this. So first of all, if you're doing cognitive e exams in a, a MRI machine, what that means is you have to get a patient into a very small space and you have to get them to look down that tube and look at a TV screen. Right away there was physical issues depending on the size of an individual. They weren't able to look down the scanner, so we had to basically rebuild the projection system using mirrors so that the cognitive tasks were reflected back so that their patients were looking up at them. And that took us about eight months to get that to work. We also had to have significant buy-in from our patients. We're asking them to be in an fMRI machine for 45 minutes to an hour. Often fasting. That's difficult for anyone to do. They can be very claustrophobic if you've ever had a, a MRI. For somebody who's struggling with weight issues, it was really uncomfortable for some of these patients. We actually had participants whose limbs went numb from being in this enclosed space, but such was their dedication to this type of research. They were really interested in trying to understand some of the factors that were affecting them because they wanted to be able to help other people. And it was really, you know, for us, working with this population, it just makes us feel really honored that they're able to give their time so selflessly. And while they were in the machine, we forced them to do a variety of math tests and memory tests that are annoying on the best of circumstances. And so again, really appreciated the dedication of this population. We also did detailed psychiatric inventories and looked at things like their disability, their nutrition status, and so everybody had to do a food frequency questionnaire for three days, looked at their sleep patterns as well as their medication history and just their overall medical status. We got a lot of information from these people, so each study visit when they were enrolled took a couple hours, and so we were asking a lot. So in terms of our study population, we have almost completed enrollment in all but one of our groups, and that group is our bipolar patients, and we're pretty close. And so we have 18 participants in three of our groups and 15 in one of them, and again, if anybody's done MRI studies, that's actually a fairly large cohort of people to be examining, considering that uh, each scan costs about five to six hundred dollars. And we have done almost 80 participants twice. And so this is actually a significant number of people to look at. So I'm going to present some of what I think is really interesting and pro provocative data over the course of the next few minutes. So I'm going to present on some of the outcomes of our recognition memory task. And basically, we looked at two things. We looked at encoding and recognition. So basically, people are put in the scanner, and they're given lists of words, and they're asked to look at each word, and they have to report if this word is unpleasant or pleasant to them. And some of them are fairly vague, like plate or hill, they have to decide whether or not this is an unpleasant word or a pleasant word. After that task is done, they're later given pairs of words and they're asked to try to remember which one they've seen before and that tests the concept of cognitive recognition. So that's basically some of the things that they're asked to do. So what we were actually expecting to find was that individuals with depression and bipolar disorder were going to look very different than the groups that didn't have mental illness. And what we're hoping to show is that over time, we're going to hopefully see some reversing. What we're really kind of shocked to find is that individuals with just weight gain as their issue, and so they didn't have mental illness, they just suffered from obesity, looked profoundly different than the healthy controls. They actually didn't look that dissimilar from individuals with mood disorder. The individuals with both mood disorder and weight gain looked a little worse, but these two groups actually have a lot in common. So right away that speaks to the fact that there's something significant happening fairly early on in individuals who just suffer from excessive weight gain that's actually starting to affect their memory and their cognitive ability. 
and that this is probably what's increasing their risk of late life dementia. And this is the first study that's actually been able to look at the specific areas that are affected. And so what we found is that areas, sort of this area up here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is actually involved in things like working memory, um, impulse control, planning, that's actually significantly affected in individuals who have significant weight problems. And there's actually something called a disexecutive syndrome, which is characterized by short-term memory, word-finding problems, impulsivity, sadness, difficulty with emotional regulation that you see associated with these kinds of changes, which again is not unlike some of the kind of presentations we're seeing in patients who are struggling with their weight and is something that often gets in the way. This is then exacerbated even further if you have a mental illness. Same thing when we looked at the recognition task. And one of the things that we're seeing here is that there's actually significant changes in this area which we would associate with the default pathway. So, you know, people have kind of heard the urban myth that you want to use 10% of your brain. It's actually not true. We use all of our brains. But some parts of it kind of go to sleep at certain times. And so your default pathway is kind of what you're doing when you're sort of sitting, vegging out. It gets engaged and it kind of filters at the white the white noise so that you can kind of sit when you're not attuned to your specific environment. When that's not working properly, you start to get problems with impulse control, for example, because all of the extraneous stimuli are not being filtered out. And so again, not surprising why somebody might have difficulty adhering to a weight loss program if their brain is suddenly wiring them to have difficulty with impulse control. So again, I think what it speaks to is just some explanations of why some people really struggle and how we have to start to look at some of these things differently. So in terms of just mechanisms, looking or trying to understand some of this explanation, we know that there are things, there are a number of things going on that when somebody has significant weight gain, we have things like inflammation happening. And that ultimately leads to a lot of medical problems, but it also can lead to cognitive loss. I think what, what's the most interesting thing is whether or not this is actually reversible. And we're starting to get into, and so we actually didn't think we were going to get anything interesting until we kind of got into this stage of the study. I actually think just the data that we have alone, looking at time one and just looking at the profound differences in cognitive capacity, which actually translates into scores on cognitive tests. So it's actually not just MRI changes, but it actually translates into functional difficulties. I think that that's interesting enough, but I think perhaps the most exciting thing is that we've actually found it's reversible. So with weight loss, you can actually start to come back to a pattern that looks like the, what you would ex expect to see in the healthy controls, even for individuals who have significant mental health problems as well. So we can actually have an effect on this. It's reversible. Now, I don't have slides on this because we have only looked at about six people and I don't want to present numbers that are that small, but I can tell you that the changes at this point are actually profound and people themselves will report that they're having less problems with their memories, that they're actually able to follow things more closely, that they seem less impulsive. Again, one of the interesting things when we think about the whole concept of the increase in inflammation that we're seeing here is that we know there's inflammation associated with weight gain, we also know that there's significant association associated with mental illness. And so even before you gain weight, people who have mental illness have an increase in inflammatory markers, and we think that that's actually one of the causative factors in making mental illness worse, which of course then gets exacerbated when these patients gain weight as well. So again, I think that maybe one of the mechanisms linking some of this is inflammation. We also have things related to cholesterol changes, all of these factors. And so as I, you know, as I said earlier, 
the data seems to indicate that it's just obesity alone affects cognition, but that all of these factors themselves can actually play a role as well, and that over time you get changes in things like the development of sort of beta amyloid plaques and tangles. These are two things that are hallmark of Alzheimer's dementia. So these are things that are found in Alzheimer's dementia that we think increased obesity is contributing to, that ultimately leads to you know, what we call cognitive aging, so somebody having dementia, having cognitive problems that they shouldn't, especially at a young age. So I think it's really exciting to think that there may be something we can do for this population. So in summary, you know, why is this important? So I think that this is important for a number of reasons. I think it starts to give us some kind of understanding, some rationale as to how we can actually intervene in terms of a, a dementia prevention and treatment, which again, given our aging population, is actually significant. It also has huge ramifications on prescribing practices for mental illness. And so for people who aren't familiar, that six or seven, every year, six or seven of the top 10 most prescribed drugs worldwide are psychiatric. Psychiatric drugs are prescribed to a big section of the population. A lot of these medications have as their side effects significant weight gain issues. And it's been one of my personal missions to make people aware of these side effects and to think rationally when they're prescribing these medications. I think if we can actually show that the cognitive changes that are such a challenge for our patient population are actually a result of the side effects of some of these medications would actually significantly turn a you know, billion dollar, trillion dollar endeavor around fairly quickly. And it may actually force some regulations with respect to the prescribing patterns of this medication. This may also give us some insights into why some people lose, really struggle to lose weight and I think help us understand in, ter in terms of sort of the treatments that we provide. These people have difficulty with attention, with concentration, with impulse control. And so often I, you know, I heard uh, Dr. Vallis speaking earlier today and again talking about the appropriate way to give information when you're trying to talk about cognitive change or motivational interviewing techniques and that you know we want to give bite-sized practical amounts of information because people get overwhelmed and they can't process. And that's actually there are you know documented now neuroimaging studies that validate this and that perhaps we need to change how you know we give information to make sure that it's actually going to be packaged in a way that works for individuals. And so again, you know this this work comes from all of the, it kind of builds on the background of all of the great work that's being done in obesity research. And again, it shows you how looking into things like the associations between mental health and obesity, using tools like bariatric surgery can actually have ramifications for medical illnesses like dementia and can impact you know, large scale public health practices like how medications are prescribed. And I think that these things come from us working together and from basic science working with clinical researchers and from people in medicine talking to people in psychiatry and psychology, from us speaking to individuals who work in occupational therapy that I think we know as you know, Dr. Shamra eloquently said in his opening remarks that this is a complicated and complex illness. And if we're going to make significant changes, it's going to be when we talk to one another and we actually start to look at the work that the different fields are doing because this is an illness that really crosses disciplines, impacts patients in every sphere. But I think that no place else is this type of interdisciplinary work done better than it's done in the field of obesity. And I think that we're really setting a bar for other areas of health research to emulate. And I think that because of that, a lot of the steps forward that are going to occur in terms of 
understanding medical illness is going to come from the fields of obesity research. And that's why I'm very, very excited to be part of this field. I'm very honored to have received this award, and I look forward to all of the things that are going to happen in this field in the next 10 years, because I, I think it's actually a very exciting time to be doing this kind of work. So I'd like to thank all of the people that helped contribute to this work. Again, I'd like to express my gratitude for this award and for your attention this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>